Welcome to Mysteries of Superstition Mountain. I'm Larry Hedrick, where we bring the past into the present for our future viewers. Today, we have another great story by Hank Sheffer. You know, one of the topics that we all talk about at Mysteries of Superstition Mountains when we all get together and have our BS section, sessions is we talk about the history, especially after all the years we've been doing this. Uh, the history, we find the people keep getting closer and closer together as, as having relationships. And I don't mean it like that, but I mean, they, they, they knew each other uh, or they're, they're part of the same family. We find events in history going from one year to the next are getting closer and closer together. And we also got to thinking, you know, it's really interesting with the superstition mountains, uh, there's so much to talk about there and, and the lost Dutchman and the, and the ghost stories and all that stuff that we forget that Arizona is not the only place that existed on this planet at the time. You know, we look at not just Arizona in that case and our own local happenings, but also those happenings in other places in this country and around the world. Let's look at the turn of the century and the early 1900s. Cowboys, cattle, shoot, Arizona was still a territory from 1863 until 1912, but there was a whole lot going on in 1900. Golly, we it hadn't been all that long that they just captured Geronimo. Why, gosh, we even had we even had the Roosevelt Dam that was being built. We had all sorts of things that were going on. So the 1900s early on were pretty interesting stuff. And it was leading into the, the 1920s. Golly, 1920s. That was the roaring 20s where we had all the guys with their machine guns over in Chicago and New York and New Orleans and down in Florida shooting each other. And they were carrying on and, and the whiskey shooting and all that crazy stuff. In the 1930s in Arizona, we had um, an insurgence of people coming out here, like Adolph Ruth. I mean, a lot of people coming out, just like him, looking for gold. Um, they've been through a depression and they, people were looking to restore their own batteries and get some money in their own coffers. And in the meantime, all the way overseas, we saw the beginnings of the emergence of a really nasty fellow who was gonna start in on the Second World War, and that was Adolf Hitler. Everybody hated him, and for good reason. Now, the 1940s saw us plunged into war. 1946 was a pretty good year, though. That was the year I was born. That's when I hit the ground running, and I, all I wanted to do was, when I got a little bit older, was be a cowboy, so I was still thinking about Arizona back then. And then the 1950s, we saw the rest of the world again at war, we had Korea going on, but the Western magazines that emerged were talking about the adventures of cowboys and Indians and gold and crazy things that were going on out in Arizona. That was the place to be. This was also when we saw the emergence of the cowboy era with all the B movies of cowboys and all sorts of wonderful heroes. Everybody wanted to be a cowboy. The 50s were truly the age of the cowboy, and Arizona was the place to be. But by the 1960s, the flamboyant, if not overactive, creative headlines supposedly describing the same old wild and woolly west had, subs had subsided pretty greatly. It was just about gone. But they were still there. Two of those writers were long gone, and everybody knew them. The incredible stories written by Edward Zane Carroll Judson Sr., <laughs> better known as Ned Butline, the guy that wrote all the, the dime novels and made heroes, all men of, that were nine foot tall and bulletproof, and they took care of adventures that nobody in the world would ever undertake except them. And of course, there's the incomparable Pierpoint Constable Bick now, best known simply as Bix. He was a freelance writer for numerous papers in the East, as well as for the California coast. He was an adventurer and was responsible in great part 
for the legend of the lost Dutchman mine to come about. Going into the turn of the century, everybody knew about the lost Dutchman mine. And everybody wanted then, just as they still do today, want to find the lost Dutchman gold mine. On the other hand, speaking for Arizona, she was still in the throes of making her own history. The lore of the superstitions and the thirst for those adventures and many treasures with their accompanying legends and lore were as much alive today as they were back then. This was at a time when the Vietnam conflict was raising hell everywhere else on the planet. Apache Junction had a major revelation going on of its own. On March 27, 1964, that's the same year I graduated for Pete's sake, two months later, the headline in the local newspaper bugle, the Apache Sentinel said, skeleton of long lost hermit Jay Clapp found. A few scattered bones, sun bleached and coyote chewed, lying helter skelter in an arroyo deep in the superstition mountains are all that remain of Yahez Clapp. Now having been a newspaper editor for several newspapers myself, that is the kind of headline that you just pray for. I mean, that gets everybody's attention. And we're talking about another dead body over in the Superstition Mountains in 1964. No one had seen or heard a word from Jay since 1961. And his mother, Audrey, had heard nothing from her son for several weeks. That set off an alarm. Now bear in mind, nobody knows who Jay Clapp is except probably his mother's, I guess, I don't know. But it wouldn't be but for another three and a half years that anybody even found Jay. He was up in the mountains somewhere, but he wouldn't be found until three and a half years later in Boulder Canyon by a hiker over from California. Ironically, this story is about a man who came to the mountain not looking for the usual treasure, no, sir, he was, completely, he was completely different than anybody who'd ever come over here. But I gotta get ahead of myself there. There's more to tell before we get to that. Yahez Klapp was born in Hollenburg, Kansas. How about that, somebody not born in Germany. He was born in 1915, and we don't know much about his childhood, though. But we do know that he attended the Southeastern State College over in Durant, Oklahoma. He was said to be a genius in mathematics and science, and this led to his deep interest in astronomy and then later astrology. These were both very, very important to him. For those of you who don't know the difference between astronomy and astrology, or won't admit that you don't know the difference, astronomy is simply the study of the planets and their relationships to each other out in the universe. Astrology, that is what probably really interested Jay Clapp, was the study of how those planets influenced people on Earth, what was going to go on in their lives. These were both very, very important to him. Now, Jay arrived in Apache Junction in 1951, where he hoped to find, find a place where he could live in harmony with nature and devote himself completely to God. He found a place uh, where there were some caves near the First Water Ranch, and he lived in those caves for 12 years. He had no use for technology or regimentation of any kind. He believed that everybody's lives would be destroyed by technology, and he just didn't want any parts of that. Uh, that pretty much makes him a loner. After he disappeared in 1961, pictures and ads, etc., were placed in papers uh, all around the country. Everybody was looking for Jay Clapp at this point, but nobody found anything. They just couldn't find Jay.
Then when the discovery was finally made in 1964, the Pinal County sheriffs attempted to ride to the location, but found the first water trail was so rough that they couldn't pass by. So they went around and they went in through the Don's campsite. Once the body was with the coroner, it was determined that Jay had died an accidental death. But even after all of that, they, uh, they still never found the skull. But there was enough evidence without the skull to identify the, the bones positively and all the other stuff that was around where they found those bones. As is always the case, there was consternation concerning whether or not Jay Clapp, well, whether his death was accidental or if it was something else. Anytime they find a body that doesn't have a head, you know, it just has to be something, got to be something dastardly. What was it then that actually took his life? Nobody really knows. We still don't know. We don't even know if he found the solace that he sought with God. The answer to that question will just have to remain one of the mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains.